think today's session is, for me, is really important. Considering we've done so much in the last two months on the prophetic and uh, how important and how applicable it is in our lives. And uh, I just felt like, like today, um, the Lord wants to, I really feel the Lord wants to, to fix something or mend something or make a, a correction in the church around the heart. And uh, you, you know that I love to, to teach on the heart and I can give you, we've taught many messages on the heart, but um, I think just before this conference as well, what I've noticed is uh, this era, like the social media era, is like a, a weird, it's awesome, but it's also like a little bit of a, it, it presents certain dangers that we need to, we need to like be aware of. Um, I mean, there's many dangers, but now I'm speaking specifically in church and in our life, you know. Um, I laugh at people. I think it's ridiculous if people don't go to church because they attend a, or they have an online church. It makes like no sense at all. You know, I mean, uh, online and all of that is fantastic. But there's important phases. There's important, uh, Jesus, uh, in Hebrews where he says, don't forsake, don't neglect the coming together of the saints. It's not just, hey, don't, don't, don't neglect coming to church. <laughs> He's talking about it's so important for the saints to come together, you know. So uh, I, think, I think if you're like that kind of, I still think it's good to go to church even if you don't connect amongst a lot of the people. But there's something really important about coming together, about getting involved in, in each other's lives, um, church and volunteering at church is a way of connecting to the body, and that's so important. And with that, it presents lots of challenges. You, you know, what people don't realize is everyone that's offended when they come to church, you have to get offended. You have to get offended when you come to church. It is so important for your growth as a Christian. You have to deal with certain things in your character and your issues. Um, so, uh, next time someone says the church hurt me, I said, like, say, I shame, you know, it's shame. You, you, you have to get offended and then you have to build a bridge and you have to get over it. You have to learn how to deal with offense. If someone didn't greet you, or if someone didn't smile when you, when you said hello, or the pastor didn't come and ask you how you were doing, thank God for opportunities where you can grow and work on your character. Amen? So uh, this, is, this is important. So with social media, you get to skip all of that. You get to skip the process of, of being hurt, <laughs> being loved, being accepted, even being rejected. I'm at a, a point in my life where I look back at all the pain, all the hurt that I've had. I'm just, thank God. Thank you, Jesus, that I was hurt in church. Shame. Thank God that I was hurt in church. Because if you can get over certain hurdles, you grow, you develop. But uh, social media is, is interesting because people start following and we start liking certain people. So we click like and we follow. you got no idea what their life looks like. Come on. You've got no idea. Let's say you like a certain celebrity preacher. You've got no idea what their life looks like. You only see who they are in, in front of the, the, the camera. And you know what? They might like you too. You know why? Because they don't know what your life looks like on the other side. And so only in church where we come together and we kind of, we become familiar with one another. And we, we see some things, some flaws in one another, and some in other things that we like. Uh, that presents the opportunity to grow. And it's true, not all people grow, and age is no sign of, a, of maturity. But God, God wants to bring us together, and we need to grow together, okay? We need to grow together. I always, for me as a pastor, we get so many people that come in and they say, yeah, we're committed. We're going to be here every Sunday. And, we, and, and I almost look forward to the opportunity when they get offended. 
Because then after that, I can see, can I build with this person? After they have been hurt, do they still come back? You know, or do they, you know, I'm not saying we go out to hurt and offend people. Please hear me right. You know, we're not trying to hurt. We're trying to, we are trying to build something for the Lord and uh, for, for you. But we're imperfect. And we're human beings. And the church is messy simply because people are messy. That's all. So um, you don't stop going to, to gym when you see, like, all the unfit, overweight people in the gym. So if you go to gym, you don't, you, you, what you see is people that are working on it, trying to get healthy, trying to get there. And that's, that's what it is also here. Yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> but we need you. And you need us. And there's some people that make it really hard. But, <laughs> but there's, place, there's place in the kingdom for, for everyone. Hallelujah. So, but I want, to, I want to speak about some of these, these issues this morning. And uh, let's, let's open, maybe let's do a study. We're going to go to First Samuel. And I want to do a little, little comparison between... Uh, between David and Saul, King Saul. First Samuel. First Samuel chapter nine. All right, verse one. He says there was a Benjaminite man named Kish, son of Abel. Okay, son of, son of, son of, son of. And then Kish was a prominent person. Verse 2, he had a son named Saul, a handsome young man. There was no one among the Israelites more handsome than he was. And he stood head and shoulders above all the people. Come on, so if Saul had a Facebook account, I'm sure it would be liked and it would be followed. Now, it's interesting because he had that charisma. He, he, was, he was tall, he was handsome, and, and people saw him. He stood out. Yeah, there's something about that guy. Now, what's interesting about uh, this was the first king of Israel. Now, God did not want to give Israel a king. He wanted to be their king. God wanted to be the king of Israel. And Samuel even told the Israelites, but they demanded, they said, we want a king like the other nations. And uh, now we have this guy. And what we see, this is, this is basically Saul's CV here to be the king. <laughs> he was tall. He was handsome, and he stood head and above all the people. And so when they saw him, they had no idea what his life was like. So long story short, um, Saul, Saul's donkeys or his dad's or his uncle's donkeys go missing. Now, I believe that was Saul's fault, okay? It's not like specifically written here. But he goes and he has to go find the donkeys. And eventually, Saul gives up. He's like, after three days, I think it is, he says, man, maybe they'll begin to think that I'm also gone. So let's just go back and forget the donkeys. So let's pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 9. And this is where Saul meets with the prophet Samuel. And so let's read verse 17. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said, Here is the man that I told you about. He will rule over my people. As Saul approached Samuel in the middle of the gate, he said, Please tell me where the seer's house is. Samuel replied to Saul, I am the seer. Go up in front of me to the high place. Today you will eat with me, and in the morning I will send you away. I will tell you everything that you are, are thinking. Don't be concerned about the donkeys that you lost three days ago, for they have been found. 
Uh, whom does all Israel desire? Is it not you and all your father's family? And anyway, let's uh, pick it up in, in chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a small container of olive oil, and he poured it on Saul's head. Samuel kissed him and said, The Lord has chosen you to lead his people Israel. You will rule over the Lord's people, and you will deliver them from the power of the enemies who surround them. This will be your sign that the Lord has chosen you. And he goes on to say, give him a whole bunch of, of signs. But what's interesting is you don't really see anything about Saul's character when he is uh, anointed as king. We just know that he is handsome, that he is tall. He lost the donkeys and he went to go found, find them. But no idea about who this guy is. Okay, no idea about who this guy is. And it's not long after that uh, there's, there's a battle that took place that Saul took up his authority and he started leading the people and he led, he led Israel into victory. And then Saul is established as king at the age of 30. Now, some of you might already know where I'm going because when uh, David, uh, basically Saul gets rejected by God. Samuel is, doesn't like it, but Saul gets rejected by God. Because he started, he was disobedient, and when he made an offering to, to God, he did it out of obligation. He felt obliged to offer. Let's, let's just read these things. Let's go to, um, I wrote it down here, 1 Samuel, and go to chapter 13. Quickly read 1 Samuel 13, and we're going to read verse... 11, Samuel said, what have you done? Saul replied, when I saw that the army had started to abandon me and that you didn't come at the appointed time and that the Philistines had assembled at Michmash. <laughs> okay. Why is that funny? I don't know. I thought, now the Philistines will come down on me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt obligated to offer the burnt offering. So, so Saul did sacrifices out of obligation, right? He referred back to, hey, this is what you have to do, so Saul sacrificed. How many guys, how many times have we just done that? How many times have we sacrificed out of obligation, you know? I felt obligated to, to do that. And, uh, and if, okay, so where I'm going to, I want to draw a comparison between Saul and David, uh, Samuel actually says to, uh, to Saul at one point, and I have not, I had it written down, but he actually says to him, hey, the, what's more important, obedience or sacrifice? And he says, obedience is more important than sacrifice. And so Saul was disobedient. But now let's go back to, now we go to David's life. After God has rejected Saul, he sends David, uh, he sends Samuel to go anoint David. All right, so let's quickly pick up on that, on that story. Oh, thank you, Lord. Is this okay? All right, so, so you know the story. Uh, Samuel meets with, with Jesse, and this is in chapter 16. And let's pick up a story in verse 4. Samuel did what the Lord told him when he arrived in Bethlehem. The elders of the city were afraid to meet him. They said, do you come in peace? He replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. So he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel noticed Eliab and said to himself, surely here before the Lord stands his chosen king. But the Lord said to him, don't be impressed by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. So Samuel is using the same CV based on Saul's appearance. He sees Eliab and he said, yeah, this guy is tall, beautiful, <laughs> handsome. This guy must be king. 
And God says to him, no, don't be, don't be impressed by his appearance. Now, this is really important. Appearance. What things appear. Now, comparing it to social media, who do you like? Who do you follow? A lot of people like and follow based on appearance, based on charisma. Okay? And we submit ourselves to people based on appearance. Okay? So we, I've seen it often and over and over, and we've addressed it. We have the Word of God preached week in, week out, all the time. I think we have how many services in the week? There is constant Word going forth. Uh, but when we advertise a prophet come to town, the church is full, full of people. And I'm sometimes really concerned at how people pull on on people they don't know, people that they don't, they've never heard anything from, you know, and submit their lives to people that can speak into their lives that they've never heard from. Now, there's a lot, I'm not saying don't trust, uh, don't trust when a prophet or someone comes in, but um, how often do we look past appearance? How often do we look past what seems good? You know, and this is the thing that, that uh, Eve, what deceived Eve, was she didn't see a rotten tree with a witch presenting an apple. Like all of us would run. She saw the appearance, and she saw that it looked good. And she saw, and she was, she was put off by appearance. So let's, let's read what God says here. The Lord said, verse 7, don't be impressed by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. God does not view things the way people do. People look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. You know, and this is, this is something encouraging to all of you. Maybe someone doesn't see you. Maybe right now you're in a, in a place in your work where you know you, you worked hard. You almost deserve <laughs> the promotion or you deserve more. And people keep on looking at the outward appearance. But God, is see, God sees what people don't see. You know, God sees what people don't see. God sees the heart. God sees the motives. God sees what you do when nobody else is looking. Okay, and so he, God finds his man in David. So we quickly pick up there. Um, verse, verse 10. We're doing a lot of Bible reading. That's what we call the, the word church. So if those who didn't know, why do we read so much Bible? The word church. <laughs> Jesus present, uh, Jesse, sorry, verse 10, presented seven of his sons to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel asked Jesse, is that all the young men? There is still the youngest one, but he is taking care of the flock. Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we cannot turn our attention to other things until he comes here. So Jesse had him brought in. Now he was ruddy with attractive eyes and a handsome appearance. Okay, that's like a bonus. Well done. And the Lord said, go and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn full of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Now, <laughs> amazing. If you, uh, David was about 15 years old. Saul was king. David was 15 years when he was anointed king. David only became king of all Israel at the age of 30. All right, only at the age of 30 did David become king. Saul became king. He was anointed, and not long after, he stepped into, to, uh, he started ruling in the kingdom of Israel. He messed up. He messed up big time, Okay. But, but David was tested. Saul lost his, the donkeys. 
David looked after the, don- after the donkeys, the sheep, okay? And he was faithful. And you pick that up in David and Goliath. He said, I will kill, I will kill Goliath the same way that I killed the lion and the bear. <laughs> okay. That's what he did when no one was looking. That's what he did when no one was looking. Oh, Lord, help me deliver the, deliver the message today. Because I'm trying to, <laughs> thank you, Lorato, you're helping me. Um, this is something that, that as a church that you can really pick up in church. You know, we hammer things like serve, like get involved. You know, uh, I, often, I often tell people when I'm, when I'm standing here and preaching, the only thing that I can compare it to is cleaning toilets. And, and that might sound shocking, but I mean, at, in our Bible school, we, we worked with a lot of sick people. I ended up having to take p- sick people to the toilet. And sometimes they don't, they don't, their aim was far off. And I often cleaned on the side of the toilets in ones and twos. Sorry for all the, the but to me, that is what preaching is like. And you think, oh, it must be awful. I'm serving. I'm serving. And, and that's what, what God looks when he sees people. He wants to see people that will really serve and love God's people. Now, I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet and look at me, man of God. I've got many mistakes. But I've seen so often, it's like uh, the moment someone hears, oh, you're called, and God wants to make you a leader in the church, their minds, they lose their minds. They, they start talking, to, talking down on people. They... They think that they're chosen, and they know, like, like, look, are you going to be a Saul or are you going to be a David? You know, oh, how much word is over your life that God has said, and you've got 15, 16, I don't know how many years ahead of you, and you haven't seen it? You know, and, and this is where I love Mother Teresa. She said, God hasn't called me to be successful. He's called me to be faithful. And I'm, I might be speaking in the context of church, but it goes to your work places where you're involved. How many of you guys have got dreams and things you were waiting and waiting for things to happen? Just be faithful with God has entrusted you with. Be faithful with even though it's a little now and maybe even though it's not your own. Go back. Look after the, the, your father's sheep. Look, look after, um, you know, deal with those challenges. And one day when... The opportune time comes and you stand on the fulfillment of what God has called you to be. You won't fail because of a flawed character. Thank God if, he's, if he sent you to, to clean toilets now and people say, oh, yeah, no, you know, he's, he's not making it. Um, I see young people, and I, I want to address this because I felt it's important. I see young people, especially with social media, they jump, they immediately get a platform People like, 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 gain a, a massive following quickly, or maybe, come on, I want to speak to some of our, our younger people that, that, that do this. You put a video out on TikTok and it goes viral and you think that you're a man of God now. You think that, that, that you've, you've, you've been anointed to, to change the world. God sees the heart. God sees the motive. Take, don't jump the process. I'm not saying don't evangelize and don't share what's on your heart, but go to church. <laughs> Get involved somewhere, you know, and learn to grow. All right. Let's, with that in mind, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, or chapter 3 and chapter 4. God made a shepherd to be king. All right. God made a shepherd to be king. He chose someone who knew how to look after somebody else's, to be faithful in somebody else's. You know, while, while David was chilling there amongst the sheep, <laughs> he picked up his guitar or his harp, and he developed another skill. And God used all those skills in his story. You know, he was a warrior. 
I mean, he took that sling. If you go look up, it wasn't a catty. <laughs> it was a sling. If you, and it's amazing when you actually go look at how these guys uh, fought. It was, these guys were skilled warriors. Where did, where did we go? Second Corinthians. Chapter 4, and we might re- make reference to chapter 3. But yeah, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do, do not believe. I'll read it again. The God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 4, I don't know about you, but I grew up believing that the God of this world is the devil. How many of you guys grew up believing that? Wow, did you guys go to church when you were kids? Or you just go to a good, good Bible teaching church? I grew up thinking that the devil is the God of this age. But the God, the God of this age is not the devil. The God of this age, of in that time, is Moses. <laughs> it's not the law. It's not anything else. The God of this age was Moses. Was Moses a God? No. Did the people make him God? Yes. And that's unfortunately people idolize people. They idolize as somebody whose face is shining. Imagine you, someone walks in here and his face is beaming forth, light, okay? I'm pretty sure, like, okay, that guy knows something that I don't. I need to, I need to listen to him. Go back to, to chapter 3. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I know it's chapter 3, we've, we've done some of this before, but he says in chapter 3, Oh, thank you, Lord. Bless you. Bless you. This is a covenant of Christ's mercy. Yeah. Verse 4. All right, I don't want to read the whole thing. Uh, sweetheart, can you make my honor Bible here? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, in verse 13. Chapter 3, verse 13. He says, Wow, my, my Bible said it completely different last night, but it still, it still works. I'm telling you, I promise you, it said it completely different last night. I don't know which Bible I was reading, but let's... Okay, so let me give you some context in the story. He is uh, telling a story about uh, when Moses went on the mountain and comparing the old covenant to the new covenant, okay? Now, when Moses first went up and he was getting oracles from God, God said, hey, the, the, the Israelites are already worshiping another God. So he went down and they were busy worshiping the calf. And right? The golden calf. And that's where Moses broke all Ten Commandments all at once, right? Okay, never mind. So, <laughs> he was, <laughs> okay, always room for a, for a dad joke. So, then <laughs> he went up again, and, uh, and the Bible says that when he came down this time, his face was shining, okay? And his face was shining. In the first time, they didn't want Moses, they wanted the golden calf, but now this time he's coming down and his face is shining. And they realize, okay, goodness, there's a God. <laughs> there is what Moses says is legit. But, but Moses would speak to them while his face was shining. And they would listen to him because his face was shining. <laughs> okay? But, what, but then Moses would put a veil over his face. Why? Because the, the shining was fading. <laughs> That's why he put the veil over his face. Because the Israelites would then begin to see, oh wait, this, this glory is actually fading. It's not something that's going to last. 
And now he writes here, can we put, just put in the Amplified quickly in that scripture? We, nor do we act like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze upon the finish of the vanishing. Now, what this is absolutely beautiful about Paul's writing, I'm not going to behave like Moses. I'm not going to put up a polished profile picture on Facebook and just pitch up to preach to you in a suit and pitch up in a flashy Mercedes Benz and make you think that I've got my whole life together. I'm going to show you all my weaknesses. I'm going to show you all my vulnerabilities so that you won't trust in man, but that you will learn to trust in God. And he's addressing the behavior of the church is that they keep on trusting in man, looking for someone to idolize. And I'm sorry, a lot of people, I don't, I don't think it's in this church at all, but people still find their gods in another preacher. <laughs> people still worship certain preachers, and we shouldn't. <laughs> we shouldn't. In Africa, I love Africa, but then they have the next major prophet, and then you have a major, major prophet. And then you have this great-grandfather prophet. It's, it gets terrible. It gets really bad. And, and I mean, don't write America off and, and all of them as well. We, t- we tend to trust people that have got their lives together. Paul didn't have any of his life together. So he says, we don't behave like Moses who put a veil over his face. You see, when, when I preach, often you'll, you'll pick up. I bring, I'm open, vulnerable, completely exposed so that you can see that if I can do it, goodness, you can do it. If, if I share the lowest of lows with everyone, and I feel like you can relate to a lot of this stuff, but, but that doesn't mean that I'm weak. <laughs> that doesn't mean that, that I don't see breakthroughs and miracles. It doesn't mean that I'm not anointed and that I'm not powerful, but my strength and my power is not from me. And I want you to remember that in every preacher, everyone that comes here, everyone that stands, every, anyone that's polished, they also, don't, don't be distracted if the face is shining. <laughs> the face is shining, it's good. The, when you see someone's face shine, you should see Jesus, the glory of Jesus, because my glory is going to fade. You know, my glory can't, can't remain. My glory faces, uh, fades. All right, so we don't act like Moses who put a veil over his face. So verse, verse 4 of chapter 4, again, now you understand. The God of this world has blinded the minds of, of those who do not believe. Now, that's not speaking about the world. Those are speaking about people who don't believe in Jesus. They believe in Moses, but they refuse to believe in Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus because the, the veil is over Moses' face. And the last time they saw, they saw a face that was shining. So they will still trust in Moses. Okay? And yet there's a gospel, there is a glory that is, that is shining forth from the face of Jesus. Today. Amen? Today. So, so how much trust do you put in people? How much trust do you put in a preacher? I'm, I'm glad. Thank God. I want you to be really selective about who you listen to. As long as you don't glorify the preacher. As long as you don't glorify the next big, big thing, okay? So let's, let's go to, let's read this. Verse 5. We do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus. When last have you heard a preacher say, I'm your slave? (laughs) When last have you heard someone introduce themselves to you as a slave? Hey, this morning, my name is Bruce, and I'm your slave for Jesus' sake. (laughs) Oh, no. 
that doesn't work. I'll go, maybe servant? I'm your servant. I'm here to serve you. But that's what Paul saw. It's like he, he saw his glory as just, I'm just a vessel. Was Paul powerful? Absolutely. The snake bit him. He just shook it off. He was shipwrecked I don't know how many times. And people, when they saw, whenever, when the people saw the snake bite him, they would try and worship him. When they, when they saw the miracles and the signs, they tried to worship him. Come on. Okay. So let's, let's, let's wrap, this, wrap this up. We do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine, shine out of darkness, is the one who shined in our hearts to give us the light of the glorious knowledge of God in the face of Christ. We have this treasure in clay jars so that the extraordinary power uh, belongs to God and does not come from us. We are experiencing trouble on every side. Who's experiencing trouble on every side? Let me just say you are, but not quite like Paul was. But let's, let's borrow this for us quickly. We are experiencing trouble on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed. Who's been perplexed lately? You know what perplexed means? It's like, what the heck is going on? What's going on? Nothing makes sense. Paul was perplexed. But we're not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And he says, always carrying in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be visible in our body. Nearly finished. And, uh, and let's, let's go to verse 18. Or 17. Our momentary light suffering is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. And we are not looking at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. Okay, who looks at that? God sees that. For what can be seen is temporal, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Let's finish up in chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 12. And just want you to see, yeah, verse 12. He says, now Paul's problem, again, he, he writes this, okay, sorry. I'm going to finish up in verse 12 and then finish in chapter 12, So. Paul writes to the Corinthian church because they, they, they keep on trusting, and he quotes, he says, these super apostles, these powerful people that they worship so easily. Let's read it. Is that up there? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 12. Oh, I didn't say verse 5, eh? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 12. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you. But we are giving you an opportunity to be proud of us so that you may be able to answer those who take pride in outward appearance and not what is in the heart. Let's read that in the Amplified Bible quickly, won't you do? So I'll just read the the B part. So that you may have a reply for those who pride themselves on surface appearance, on, a, on the virtues they only appear to have, although their heart is devoid of them. There are some things that you can only get, like in the field, you know, in, with the sheep, <laughs> amongst the sheep. In my personal life, I didn't know that that what, is what God was doing when I'm cleaning toilets or I'm serving in a church, when I'm putting up speakers and getting no recognition or no acknowledgement for it. We shouldn't even look for that pat on the back. Yeah? <laughs> but, uh, and, and in your own life, you need to realize, I think we, we opened up the, this year with, um, I'm saying two or three things at the same time this morning. I'm trying to tell you to not be discouraged about, obviously, the process. 
and that the process is important. And where you're at, I do believe that if you'll be faithful with where you're at as insignificant, or maybe, maybe today you're even in a place with great influence and great significance, even more you need to make sure you, you look at the heart. The best thing is get involved in the church. Get amongst the people, you know, submit to the Word of God. And, okay, I have to finish with this one, and then and I'll wrap it up. 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 9, he said, he said to me, my grace is enough for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Wow. So I will, I will boast most gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may reside in me. The good thing about showing weaknesses and vulnerabilities is that God doesn't leave you there is that he does the most extraordinary, supernatural things through a person who is completely yielded to Jesus. He will do the most extraordinary, supernatural things to someone who is not trying, through someone who is not trying to perform and to show something about himself. He's going to do incredible things through people who know that their strength comes from God and their vessels. Amen? So Paul says, he says, the problem is the people trust the vessel. The people put their trust in the vessel. The people glorify the vessel. But he says, I don't want that pressure. I don't want that. I am not that for you. I'm not going to act like Moses. I'm not going to put a, a, a veil over my face. I want you to see that I'm weak. And so when you see that I'm weak, you will see that God is strong through me, that I can stand in front of, doesn't matter who, but God comes through. God is faithful through, through me. Amen? Come on. So, so check, your, check your own heart. I, I always believe, um, yeah, man, I can, I can preach so much. Have a read through, through um, Second Chronicles, the last couple of chapters. And you just see how David, he was such a, a king after God's heart. He gave everything. People remember Solomon for the temple. It was David. It was David. You must see how much gold he, he put aside. He gave everything of him towards that temple. He put the blueprints down. He put everything. Like he envisioned the whole thing. And he gave everything. And he said, I will not offer God anything that costs me nothing. Where Saul would give out of obligation. He just had a surrendered heart. He just had a, wow, a yielded heart. And uh, this, is, this is the life of us believers. And I, I hope that I'm articulating it well this morning so that you can just see. Look into the heart. Look past surface level. And uh, we're getting preachers here this weekend and preachers that I, that I, really, that I really trust. But it is, it's your responsibility to honor the men of God or the people that come and minister, but it is also your responsibility to make sure that you worship Jesus, that you connect to Him, that you get your word from Him. And uh, thank God for all the preachers that let me down. Hallelujah. Thank God for all the offense. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that I learned to trust in you and nobody else. Thank you that I learned to hold on to you. It doesn't mean that I don't listen to anyone. I listen to so many, but I but I, I, I trust in Jesus. Amen? All right. I'll take a moment to think about everything. <laughs> yeah. Take a moment just to, just to think about, uh, you know, it's, it's really so simple. God just wants to work through us. God wants to work through, through yielded vessels at the end of the day. Yeah. Is I'll be a servant, and the other title that I, that I love is I'm a son of God. Those are the two most important titles in the, for me in the kingdom. Amen. Father, I pray for this word that went out today, that it will bear fruit, that it will land in good ground, that it will land in the heart. Father, forgive us 
where we have trusted in men, when we have put our confidence in, in what someone said. Someone said that I'm going to be this or be that at this time in my life. Someone said this is going to happen, and we've, we've missed the plot completely because we've put our trust. We've given people the reverence that belonged to you. Father, I pray, Lord, help us understand what, what healthy honor is, how we can honor one another in the body. But, Lord, that we'll take on the assignment to grow up in, in Christ, to be faithful even when it hurts, to, to keep going even when our heart aches or where we've been misunderstood or overlooked and not seen. Lord, thank you that we can keep moving knowing that you don't look at the outward appearance. You look at the heart. And Lord, that we'll all be known as people whose hearts are towards you, towards you, hearts for you, hearts that, that want to hear well done from you, and not necessarily a pat on the back from the people around us. Yeah, healthy honor. Help us understand that. Help us take on that assignment to grow up in Jesus. And with that, while we're praying about it, I pray for everyone that has experienced a hurt or an offense or battling through something that happened through, through all the churches and wherever you've been, that you will right now in this moment begin to see how the Lord can turn that and work that for good. If we will allow it to, the Bible says that he will, he will take that light affliction and turn it into an everlasting weight of glory. <laughs> Give you complete victory in that. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for the anointing that remains and does not leave. That is not conditional. It is unconditional. But, Father, that we will really take the anointing with maturity and, uh, yeah, and grow in Jesus. Amen.